All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI Podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm joined by David Rosenberg. David is head of the machine learning strategy team in the office of the CTO at Bloomberg. Before we get into today's conversation, be sure to take a moment to head over to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your listening platform of choice. And if you enjoy the show, please leave us your best rating and review. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Great to be back. It is amazing to think that uh, it's just over, what, five years ago that you were on the show? Yeah, it's been a while. It has been a while. The world has changed in the AI, in the AI scene. Absolutely, absolutely. You were just mentioning that uh, at that time we were doing just audio-only shows. Now we're uh, doing this, of course, in audio and video. It can be seen on YouTube. Um, but uh, I think that's probably the least of the changes that we've seen, especially in this NLP space. What do you think? Yeah, I'll say, I mean, I think for me, when uh, GPT-3 came out, it was about three years ago, um, that, was, that was a moment of uh, kind of, wow, this is different. This is something that seems really new. The capabilities were really impressive. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, in that vein of GPT, today we're going to be talking about uh, your project, which is Bloomberg GPT, and how you uh, trained and built a, a large language model specializing in financial uh, language. Um, why don't we start by having you, uh, before we jump into that, share a little bit about your background just to uh, refresh those who weren't listening in five years ago. See, academically, I studied math in undergrad and I, um, you know, in college, I was already interested. I'd heard about neural networks. I wanted to do a project on neural networks. It's just a funny anecdote. My uh, stochastic processes instructor said, uh, don't do neural networks. This is a 2000. Don't do neural networks. Those are kind of passe. Do these uh, Bayesian networks. So I took a detour into probabilistic modeling for uh, quite some time. Um, anyway, I went to grad school in statistics, focusing in machine learning. Uh, and moved out to New York City, where I was at a startup for many years and uh, eventually joined Bloomberg, where I'm in the CTO office, uh, working on machine learning strategy, heading the machine learning strategy team. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the background of Bloomberg GPT. I mean, it, you know, in one sense, it seems like an obvious thing to try to build, but, you know, what were some of the, what was the need that drove you to try to create that? It wasn't, it's not necessarily so obvious to, to build it. Um, so that's kind of one of the things that we do in the CTO office is make these strategic decisions on what to invest in, you know, with both money and time and people's resources, uh, in particular on new machine learning technology. That's what our group would be focusing on. And so as I mentioned, I guess it was uh, mid-2020 when GPT-3 came out and the question was, you know, is this a, a direction we pursue, we invest in, because it was clearly a big investment, right? We Everyone knew how much GPT-3, but we didn't know how much GPT-3 actually cost to make, but it was clear that it was a huge investment. Um, and we decided that it was worth making the move, kind of maybe there's some risk there, but it, it seems like the possibilities were, were pretty great. So um, that was kind of a decision made back in late 2020 to start uh, building towards this goal of our own GPT-3 style model. And I'm not sure we knew exactly at that time what it would be used for. We're still experimenting to figure out how best to use it for our purposes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you provide a, an overview of it and um, you know its, its capabilities? In some ways, it's a general purpose model. It's, it's also... Uh, we see kind of purpose built for finance applications. So our training data set was a split between the standard general purpose training data that are used for building, we don't know exactly what GPT style, uh, chat GPT models use, but things like OPT and Bloom, we know the data sets that they used. And we kind of followed a lot of their uh, training data plan for about half of our data set. And then we had another half of the data set that is based on Bloomberg's data uh, collected over many years, starts in 2007. Uh, that's called FinPile. So about half of our training data was finance-specific Bloomberg curated data. 
And digging into that a bit more, are we talking about um, kind of financial reports or articles? Or I, I think I remember the last time we spoke, you were um, th- that conversation was focused on kind of extracting uh, information from semi-structured documents. You know, did some of that come into play? What was the, you know, the makeup of FinPile? Very much a mixture of all the things you mentioned. So um, a big chunk of it is uh, news data that we have, like news that we have um, acquired. It's financial filings. Uh, that's like company filings, uh, press releases, um, transcripts of calls that we have. It's kind of a broad collection of financial data. Yes, some of those some of those documents have. Uh, tables and charts um, in them. So uh, we didn't do any new additional processing specifically for this train data set, but when that information was already extracted, we used it. And did you kind of throw it all into the, the training bucket or did you do anything? Um, you know, is there anything to be done kind of taking advantage of the, you've you know, the semi-structured nature of a lot of that information. You've got a lot of metadata in addition to raw text. We didn't do anything specifically different for the for structured data. It was kind of tokenized the same way as everything else. But one thing we did uh, have some concern about or some focus on was numerical data because finance data has a lot of numbers in it. And um, we were concerned with the way that, I guess a lot of previous work used the GPT-2 tokenizer, which doesn't treat numbers in any special way. So you'll get tokens, you know, a long number like, I don't know, 5,234 may tokenize into 523 and then four, or it may tokenize into 52 and then 34. So, and, and we were concerned that that doesn't, that makes it, it feels like a harder problem for the model to solve when it doesn't have any kind of consistent representation of, um, of numbers. So we took a stab at it, uh, following kind of the palm model also did this, where we broke up numbers into individual digits. So, you know, maybe the model could then figure out the idea of first digit is the highest order and the second digit is the second highest order and, and so on. So that's, that's kind of one uh, thing we did to accommodate this financial data. So talk a little bit about the, the process of training the model. It's, um, you know, for the, the size that you achieved, you know, there are few out there who have uh, attempted that. And there are a lot of, uh, I'm imagining there was a lot of kind of new ground to explore. Uh, is that the case? I think we're still at the stage where it's always kind of an adventure training one of these very large models. When we started our process, there was OPT model for Meta. And they did a very nice job of sharing their um, kind of training logs, all the, all the challenges that they went through, they were very detailed describing them and what they did to resolve them. And so we kind of had that as a bit of a roadmap. And then Bloom uh, also published, the, the Bloom model from Big Science, Hugging Face, also published their training logs, training chronicles. But that was, that was about it as far as detailed information on how to handle the types of issues that come up when you're actually doing the training. Um, Kind of because of that, we want to control our risk by making the model as close as we could to something that we knew worked before. Um, and so in our case, we copied the blue model architecture fairly closely uh, with some small tweaks, um, the tokenizer being one of them. We, I mentioned the way we handled numbers being a, a key piece of that. Um, I, one or two other spots where we change. I might I could talk about that later as well. Um, so the training process starts, and we call it V0 because there are subsequent versions. And uh, one innovation or thing we tried uh, in the first version of the model was something that seemed innocuous enough, which was well, we noted that in our data, in the Bloomberg data set, we call FinPile, all the data po- all the documents are timestamped and the data further back is not as good quality uh, for whatever reason there's any less of it and moreover it seemed like 
the most recent data would have the most correct and accurate data, factually speaking. And so it seemed reasonable to do something you could call it a curriculum learning or whatever it is. It's not a purely random mix shuffle of the training data. We decided to, sh to order the training data kind of sequentially in time for the, for the part that's FinPile, for the Bloomberg piece. The, the other data, which is about half of it, was, was randomly shuffled. Um, so we start training. And as for our validation data to like measure progress, we are using kind of the month following all that training data. So the most recent data would be our validation data. So we're training for uh, four or five days, getting started. And we notice like the training performance curve levels off, the validation performance curve levels off, or at least it slows down a lot. We're looking at it. Is it actually still learning or has it stopped learning? It's hard to tell. Um, and after about eight or 10 days, we, we decided to stop that training. And we were worried that, you know, maybe the, the curriculum learning line of sorting by timestamp of the, of the document was fine, but it didn't seem to be working. And it seemed like that might have been a step too far into the unknown. And so we started over, got rid of that curriculum learning. So we randomly shuffled all the data. And that was kind of the beginning of version one of training. Hmm. Started off better um, for about, I think, eight days or so. Uh, nice, nice improvement of the uh, training performance and validation performance. We also were tracking uh, the gradient, the norm of the gradient, which is uh, a spot where you often see issues. Like, so the gradient norm will um, suddenly spike up or gradually increase. And we we're, so we're looking out for that. And sure enough, after something like eight days, we see the gradient norm like almost angle upwards and kind of start linearly climbing. And couldn't figure out what it was from. And unfortunately, it also coincided with the validation performance kind of getting worse and, and spiking. So that's when we turn to our, you know, the, the, the limited amount of roadmap we have from OPT paper who also uh, encountered these kind of gradient norm spikes. We started, not only was there a gradual in increase in um, the gradient norm, there are also these spikes in gradient norm, which corresponded with poor performance. And they had all kind of this recipe they used to um, get past these spikes, which was kind of roll back to a checkpoint, maybe a hundred steps before the before the spike. You reshuffle your training data, maybe you lower your learning rate. That's kind of the recipe. We tried that and didn't seem to help that much in the sense that we weren't getting kind of nice, compelling learning curves that are like you know improving performance gradually, gradually. We dug into the weights, you know, with these gradient norm spikes. What's happening to the weights? We found something really interesting, which to this day, don't really know the source of this. So it's kind of an open question. Um, there's 70 layers in our network. And the only thing that seemed off was in the very first layer. The very first thing in the first layer is this layer norm. Um, and the scale weights of that layer norm, right when the gradient norm started increasing, those parameters went from decreasing to steadily increasing. It's very strange. It's like all the weights were more or less uh, throughout the model, more or less kind of on average staying the same magnitude and these layer norm scales were going down and then up. The down piece we think was a bit of a bug in how we were using our optimizer. We, we were applying a weight decay, which pulls the weights towards zero to scale weights, which should be centered around one. So that was a little bug that we fixed in version two. Did kind of a thorough, um, called through our code and we found a few other things like involving mixed precision, uh, for whatever reason, um, the bloom model either didn't need to, or just didn't use kind of the full 32 bit precision in certain parts of the model where often one does use them because the, the lower precision weights are kind of not precise enough. We put that back in, um, we fixed the uh, we decided to put an extra layer norm at the very beginning before the first layer is kind of additional protection. And we started over again, uh, this time with the shuffle data and, um, and that was version two. So th this was finally the version of the model that worked. Um, and we ran for 42 days with nice steady decrease, uh, before we ran into some, some challenges.
um, which was basically that the model stopped learning after uh, about 75% of our data set. And we tried a bunch of stuff, um, but really uh, we were kind of towards the end of our budget and uh, nothing seemed to be working compellingly. And so we, we kind of called it and said, this is it's a performance on downstream task is already um, good, uh, more than met our expectations and hopes. Um, we still have a chunk of training data to apply to it later when we have some more time and ideas. Um, and yeah, that was the, that was the training experience. Oh, wow. Wow. So 42 days was the, uh, around the total time of training. 42 days, uh, until we started kind of leveling off and then we ran it for another week or so. And, uh, and that was it. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the, the team that was involved in pulling this together? You mentioned budget. I'm curious about that. I'm curious about, uh, infrastructure, uh, what you use there, uh, talk through some of those things. Sure. So the team was ultimately about nine people. Um, some were hands down coding. Uh, about four were doing kind of actual implementation work. Uh, three of those were focused on the machine learning data aspects. One was focused on kind of optimization and compute aspects. Um, the rest of us uh, or in some sense advisory, but it was, you know, calling the literature for things that might help fix the models and uh, working on evaluation and uh, those sorts of things. So compared to, you know, a lot of these large models, we had a relatively small team. As far as hardware infrastructure, we are training on Amazon SageMaker. We use their SMP platform for optimization. Uh, all NVIDIA, we're using... Uh, 40 gigabyte A100 GPUs. We had 512 of them. Our model was kind of small tweaks from the Bloom model source code, which I mentioned. And can you talk about cost? The way it worked from a big picture is that we bought in advance some number of hours on these GPUs. Um, I think it was, I think it was like 1.3 million GPU hours. So I, I don't know offhand. I think you could find the rack rate for that. I, I think we had some negotiated rate for a certain amount of hours in a certain period of time. So you've got this model, you've trained it up. You mentioned uh, you had some folks working on validation. Talk through validation and, and how you uh, evaluate the performance of the model. So there's two pieces of that. There's kind of evaluation, evaluation while we're training and then evaluation after the fact. Um, the while we were training evaluation evolved a bit over time. It started with just this validation set from the last month of training data, which I mentioned earlier. As we were going, we added in another validation set that was chosen randomly from the training period, which is a little bit more comforting because it's, that would have the same distribution as the training distribution, whereas this last month may be different. So um, it's a little bit harder to interpret. As we got further into it, we had actual downstream tasks that we would evaluate on. There's MMLU, which is... Um, kind of like a giant multiple choice question, task covering knowledge from like a wide range of areas, pretty hard questions. Um, and then there's BBH, Big Bench Hard, uh, which we took kind of the multiple choice questions from. Um, those are the things that we were monitoring while we were training. Afterwards, we did um, kind of a much more thorough analysis of performance. We had, uh, I guess one. I guess one category is internal and external tasks. And another is uh, rather like kind of Bloomberg specific. These are our tasks for our downstream needs. And then the general um, publicly available tasks. Um, and within those, there are kind of financial specific and generic ones. So kind of our, we consider a cohort of models to compare to, um, we looked at OPT, the 66 billion parameter model. Ours is 50, so that was kind of the closest of the OPT family. And the Bloom model. Um, and uh, the GPT Neo X model from Eleuther. And uh, so that was, those are the ones that we, they're open source. Those are the ones that we could run on anything. And then other models will publish in their papers their performance on some benchmarks. So when we could, we pulled in kind of reported numbers. So that's how we got the GPT-3 numbers we compared to in the paper, the Palm numbers we compared to. Um, and the results were, uh, 
were really good. We were um, kind of at least competitive with Bloom and OPT on on most tasks, and and probably were better more often than not. Um, but certainly, as far as general purpose tasks, we were in the same ballpark as as the others in this in this cohort. And on financial benchmarks, financial data, we we were significantly better. Um, and you know, one possible reason, there's probably two reasons, and I don't know how to allocate to each, but one is the, the data we trained on. It was, you know, half of it was financially sourced. Um, and perhaps the tokenizer approach helped. It's hard to know. We didn't, uh, do the ablation studies, um, to determine that as far as what we would do next, that's one thing that, uh, that I've we'd focus on, I think, is more experimentation on these small changes, maybe on a smaller model size to know what makes a difference and what doesn't. And did you already have, or did you need to create a kind of a financial benchmark for, um, for evaluation? External exist. Um, one that I like is a uh, con fin QA. It's kind of like reading comprehension for, an, for financial documents. There's a, there's text. There's at least one, table of financial information, and then some question that requires some amount of numerical reasoning. So that exists, uh, that we performed very well. And that was, that's one where the gap between our model and other models was, was maybe most impressive. Um, for internal, we had internal tasks. Uh, Before we go into the, the next set of tasks, you mentioned that that, uh, that benchmark requires some degree of numerical reasoning. Uh, elaborate on that. Does it require like arithmetic? Uh, because these models are kind of notoriously poor at at that kind of reasoning, or is it more, you know, relative quantities, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think it's some amount of looking up. It's like reporting out from a table. Um, I think there's some basic arithmetic, but I don't remember the exact breakdown there. Got it. So you're going to mention uh, benchmarks around internal tasks. Yeah, so we have we do a lot of uh, sentiment analysis on various sources. So there's um, news and social media and um, kind of company statements. And so we have uh, kind of internal benchmark data sets for that sort of thing for our own internal tasks. Another interesting thing that we'll do is um, NER, NED, named entity disambiguation. So you're reading a news article, it mentions Apple, being able to map that to our knowledge base where Apple is you know, a, a well-defined company. So for example, you can map it to its stock ticker or something. So this would be a task that would be kind of finance specific. And that was one of our um, internal benchmarks that we did well on, that we're pleased with our performance on that. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, this is not so much a formal benchmark because it's more generative and it's, it is more challenging to, uh, challenging to evaluate these things. But um, internal in Bloomberg, there's something called a, uh, it's called BQL, Bloomberg Query Language. You could think of it as an SQL, but um, maybe much more uh, complicated or um, capable uh, for combining and operating on all the data internal to Bloomberg or, or a large piece of that data. Um, and so we want to know, it's, it's difficult to use. So uh, could it translate a natural language request into this Bloomberg query language? Now, it wasn't trained on Bloomberg query language at all. Um, and so we, we tried this in kind of a few shot setting where we gave some examples. So it would see BQL in the prompt. And uh, it, did, it did rather well. It did rather impressively that it kind of could pick up the, this, the sense of this language from you know, 10 shots or something. Um, we also played around with, uh, news headline generation, um, you know, given an article, can you come up with a, a good headline automatically? Um, so yeah, these are kind of things we were experimenting with in a less formal basis because they're just harder to evaluate numerically. Got it. And how many, uh, what's the context size that the model has? 2048. I'm curious, maybe stepping back a little bit, given how quickly the space is evolving, like what's your, your meta take on, like, is it 
worth doing an effort like this? You, you mentioned you spent, you know, in excess of a million dollars, um, you know, models, uh, the kind of the bay you baseline against bloom, the, you know, your baseline, if you were to choose to do this today would probably be different. Um, and your, your comps would be different. Like, you know, is this, was it worth it from a learning exercise? Was it worth it? And, you know, as a practical, Hey, we can use this or we can get a year of use out of this thing. And it's better than what we had as an alternative. Um, you know, is it, you know, who would you recommend take this on? Like, you know, what's your, what's your feeling on all that? Yeah. Great questions. Um, so one question that we kind of wrestled with a lot internally, it was, um, should we build from scratch or taking an existing model and fine tune it? But it turns out there actually aren't that many open source models that you can take the weights fine tune for commercial use um, of the scale that we're considering. When we started, there just weren't a lot of options. Presumably more will come up. And so the question will become more and more relevant. Do we fine tune? And um, I think, I think it's unclear still, uh, you know, in our case, for example, what would we be fine tuning on? We have like 350 billion tokens in FinPile. That's all, that's like a full data set. Um, do, is it as effective to kind of take an existing model and then fine tune it on essentially, I guess you could almost call it domain adaptation where it's, it's not fine tuning. It's like completely kind of pushing the distribution somewhere else. Um, it's, that may end up being the right approach, but I think the science on that is not even um, figured out. It's, it's almost harder. There's almost more options on how you fine tune than to train from scratch. Um, and if you have a very large data set to fine tune on, it's not clear that there's a, uh, there's a massive financial difference. There's also the question of, uh, you know, to just train a small model, a smaller model that's just on very domain specific information. Um, so there's certainly examples of that in, in the, in the literature that people speak about. And, you know, maybe that's, that's another approach for, to advise on people training from scratch, the route we made, I mean, for us, it was a great learning experience. Uh, and, uh, we're continuing on this path, you know, another option that I don't know that you mentioned is kind of using existing models as an API, like sending data to OpenAI or, um, you know, there's other companies that do the same and kind of that's, that's a step too far for us. Cause there's certain data that we just don't want to send away. We, we want to handle it in house. We don't want to um, have that process at this point by other people's systems. So some people are going to have concerns about um, wanting to keep data, in-house, um, on-prem. It's a tough call. It's a large investment uh, to build a model from scratch, um, uh, but it gives you more options. And do you feel like the, you, you mentioned that the um, you followed very closely the Loom architecture and you took a lot out of their training notes, um, you know, kind of suggesting that the things you run into in training are very, um, specific to the, the architecture that you're using, do you feel like the things that you learned are transferable to kind of the next model architecture that you might want to explore? Or do you feel kind of locked into, you know, building on this current architecture? No, we don't feel locked in. Um, you know, a lot of the things you learn are, um, you know, what you instrument in your model training and, uh, you know, just kind of building up the infrastructure or knowing what infrastructure you want to build, um, for, uh, you know, testing the model as it goes. Um, and that sort of thing. Uh, I think we have a lot of work to do still on uh, data set selection. Um, there's, uh, you know, we didn't follow Bloom's data set. We, cause we brought in a lot of our own stuff. There's questions on cleaning, which seem to be really important. Also, um, I guess for a while, there is a sense that it's really best to train on every data item once. You know, you don't want to repeat documents. Um, and it's not so clear how important that is at this point. Um, and so, you know, the relative weightings of the different 
portions of the data set. You know, Wikipedia seems like a great source of knowledge. Do you do you run that through ten times as opposed to, you know, we kind of had it three times because it happened to show up in various collections that we used. Um, so that's a that's a those are kind of problems that apply to any architecture. Tokenizer is another really interesting piece of the puzzle that's orthogonal to architecture. Uh, I mentioned a little bit with digits, um, but there's big questions on, you know, how big should your vocabulary size be? Uh, one other change we made from most models is our vocabulary size was about 150,000. Uh, a typical English only model is like 50,000. Um, so that's another spot where we deviated from the, um, from most, from most model approaches. And it would be interesting. We did not have time to do extensive studies on smaller models to see like pros and cons. And, um, but you know, that the learnings that we did on that would also kind of are kind of independent of architecture. A lot of the conversation in the broader around uh, LLMs more broadly is around, um, you, you know, there are two, uh, I guess, two numbers, kind of the number of parameters and the context length. Are, are either of those things on your at the top of your list of things you would do differently, like or things that you, um, you know, that are lacking, like that are that feel like big constraints for you? Or are there, you know, some of the, are the things that you just mentioned, like exploring smaller models, all these other things, are those like more interesting to you to, to play around with? Uh, you know, and I guess I'm kind of getting at like, like, is it, you know, is it just scale or is it like all these other um, kind of nuances that you've been describing? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, there's a lot of stuff going there. It's not just scale. You know, the Llama paper was pretty interesting because their smaller models did great. And it's, you know, it seems like it was largely due to, they were able to, they continued training for a trillion tokens or something on the smaller models. Um, way more than Chinchilla Optimal uh, for those smaller model sizes. Um, so, you know, as we think about what's happening next, you are asking, is it, you know, bigger models, smaller? Um, in some sense, we a little bit want to experiment more with the smaller models for a while because they're so much easier to use. Um, you can run inference on a smaller model um, on a single GPU, whereas our 50 billion parameter model, you need a, kind of an inference platform to use it because it's got to go across multiple GPUs. Um, so it, there is some interest in seeing how much we can get out of the smaller models, maybe the llama style training. There's clear performance differences between different models of the same size. And so, you know, it's a matter of collecting those different tricks and secrets, secret sauces that make kind of get the best use out of the data you have for your kind of compute budget. So we have a lot to learn there. Um, and uh, kind of that's, that's part of our research right now. Has, has this exercise, has the exercise given you any perspective on, you know, there's a relationship between train from scratch versus fine tune versus context, right? And, you know, because a lot of times you want this large context because you, you know, because, so you can stick in a lot of context that isn't in the base model. Um, but you've trained from scratch on the kind of data that you work with. Are, have you found then that you don't need a large context um, because of that? Or do you still find yourself wanting more tokens to be able to construct your prompts? Right, right, right. Okay, so how I think about that is the kind of the big training, the, the, you know, the fact that we have this fin pile in the data set that puts in knowledge into the model and maybe kind of ways to deal with certain types of, of document. Um, then there's, you know, there's a step that always happens after the initial training um, instruction tuning, it's typical, where you kind of condition the model to answer questions of a certain type. And that's where you can kind of, um, you know, before you do the instruction tuning, if you wanted to solve a problem it hasn't seen or a question type it hasn't seen in the in the training data, you kind of give it a bunch of examples of exactly that question, um, and you continue training it on that sort of thing, and that kind of takes the place of this multi-shot um, learning, which you know 
when you do multi shot, you want you want to you may want a big context window, so you could put a lot of examples, put a lot of information in. So instruction tuning kind of gets rid of that need to some extent. You know, there's other things you'd want a giant context window for, which is just like you know new information. So you have a new document; it's 70 pages long. You want to be able to interact with it, query it. What does it say? Reason with the model about it. Um, and I I don't see a way around having a very large context window for that sort of thing. Um, but it's, but it's an interesting point you're making. Like, does the larger would would we would, do we not need a larger window for things like um, few shot learning because of that fine tuning we do, because of the training on FinPy and stuff? Um, yeah, maybe so. Maybe that helps. And can you talk a little bit about the instruction tuning process? What was the your model there? And so that's ongoing. That's ongoing. Okay. You know we're using. A combination of kind of publicly available uh, data sets for that, uh, like Flan, and internally we have, um, you know, it certainly wasn't created with the idea of being used for instruction tuning, but we do have a lot of internal data that's of the sort that we can use for this sort of thing, uh, for instruction tuning, to kind of prep the model for the types of tasks we have. And... Can you elaborate on that? Is this like... So last time we spoke, I mentioned um, we have a huge team, uh, you know, thousands of people working on Bloomberg data. And so it's, it's, it's a lot of it is like kind of annotation tasks. So, um, you know, here's a paragraph. I identify the key entities being mentioned. You know, that'd be a named entity recognition task, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, the type of the way we store this data, this is kind of like labeled data that can be um, repurposed as kind of instruction tuning. So you kind of have this this uh, um, it's kind of labeled data set, and you kind of reformat it into um, you know queries and responses, essentially. Right, because the you know the original training data. It's not. It's not in that format. It's just. It's just documents. It's not like you know, find the the key company mentioned in this paragraph. It's, it's so. Uh, that's what the instruction tuning does, or this labeled data has, and that we use for instruction tuning. And so, did you find then between the the public uh, instruction sets and this reformatted internal? Uh, data that you did not need to do any custom uh, instruction tuning data set development? Oh, I see. In, in terms of like asking... Like asking new questions, getting new experts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. Okay. So we haven't had to yet. But that's certainly a possible direction. Yeah, it seems like that could be useful. More data can always... seems uh, it can be helpful. Does anything stand out uh, as a... Uh, I was going to ask about kind of limitations or challenges, but I mean, we've talked a lot about that. I, I guess I'm, I'm wanting like a netted out, like, you know, these are the top, like, you know, top end things that, you know, we think are still open issues. Um, and for, for you and like the order in which you think you need to address them. When we built our model, it was, um, there's definitely a time constraint. We skipped a lot of steps um, kind of that would have been really helpful had we had more time uh, to kind of gain some for for the areas where we deviated from the traditional work to gain some conviction that that was a good change. For example, the way we we had a new tokenizer um, uh, and the data splits we used, rather the um, the composition of the data we used. So um, it's almost like we got a lot of confidence that we can do it. We can build this big model and it's useful and it's good. Now that we have this confidence and we're kind of going to double down our investment, let's kind of start back again a bit. Let's work on experiments at a smaller scale. We're going to try out, you know, a variety of tokenizations, a variety of data mixes and data pre-processing and architectural choices and be more disciplined on that experimentation. That's a step that we kind of had to skip by necessity 
that is very important. Um, and so I think kind of going back to step one with the knowledge you already have is, is, um, is, is a big thing that we're going to jump into next. And then we can scale back up. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you, we want both small models and larger models um, for practical use. Uh, on the topic of practical use, um, you, you mentioned these internal tasks. What, what's the process? Um, how do you think about kind of productionizing something like this? Is this in production on the path to production? Is it a learning experiment? And, you know, you're using other things when you're, you know, for your actual internal tasks, where are you and all that? So nothing um, from this model is in production yet. It's all research and experimentation. We're certainly um, trying it out in a variety of directions. Um, you know, can it help us solve existing uh, problems that we already have solutions for? Can it help us solve them in a better way or um, uh, with less investment in training data, for example? But we're also really interested in new use cases. Um, as I mentioned, this natural language to BQL, um, we'd love to kind of have an internal code assistant that knows our libraries and that sort of thing. Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, put in a large document, be able, being able to interact with it, uh, ask it um, what information it contains, that sort of thing. Uh, so in some sense, we're very open-minded and working a lot of directions to see where uh, this can have the most impact. As far as um, production use, uh, you know, we're, we need to be very cautious about it. You know, there's no one has solved the hallucination problem. Uh, you know, these language models say wrong things, do wrong things, do strange things. Uh, so there's got to be kind of a process around it that makes it safe to use um, either just internally uh, or um, you know, for clients at some point in the future, potentially. Mm -hmm. And have you started digging into what that process might look like and, or, and, or how to address some of these issues, or are you waiting for kind of the broader research to catch up on the kind of the core issues? I think we're, you know, we're starting with, uh, internal usage and for that, it's not so much, it's not as much an issue of kind of safety and reputation as it is function you know does it is it useful does it do the job and that's what we're focusing on right now yeah, but you've got to be thinking about like if it's you know you're doing internal tasks and people come to rely on it they kind of become less discriminate discriminative and you know it's answers and like you've got to have some system for them to to kind of check the work of this thing and if they're doing that should they just do the other thing in the first place like it's a bunch of interesting questions in there, I would think. That's a very interesting question. Yeah. You know, how do you, if you need a human oversight, but how, if it's the, the AI is so good, how do you keep the human engaged, um, attentive? Yeah, that's, that's a real interesting issue. Yeah. Um, have you started thinking at all about um, kind of ethics, ethical considerations, um, you know, beyond kind of the, the brand risk that you've mentioned? that uh, come into play in fielding models like this? Yeah, we're absolutely concerned about that. Um, I think we're, we're definitely kind of monitoring the literature and the broader discussion on things like that. Um, so we're certainly attentive to that area, but I think, you know, keeping things internal and also frankly, focusing on issues of finance topics and code completion and, you know, kind of basic summarization tasks intuitively that keeps us a bit apart from a lot of the most obvious issues that would come up, but it's certainly, certainly a concern. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this is super uh, interesting project, David, and it's been great to reconnect and learn a little bit about how you've tackled it. Yeah. Thanks. Great, great chatting again. Thanks so much for the time.